Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's conversation on reimagining the role of the private sector in addressing undernutrition. This is a Nutrition for Growth Summit side event. I am Salim Nakweira, working with the Power of Nutrition as head of Africa Partnerships and Brands. This session is co-hosted by Gets Ventures Exemplars in Global Health. Thanks to our speakers and thanks to our broad audience of businesses, NGOs, philanthropies, funding agencies, and all other stakeholders for joining us today. Together, we are here to discuss the critical role businesses can play in addressing undernutrition. Given their role in the marketplace, their expertise, their resources, and impact on livelihoods and communities. This is widely known. But today, we want to explore new solutions through new data and our expert panel discussion. Over the next 90 minutes, you will hear from Zulfi Buta. Zulfi will be taking us through case studies of country progress in addressing undernutrition and consideration of opportunities for greater private sector action. Zulfi is the founding director of the Institute of Global Health and Development and the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at Aga Khan University and a co-director for the Center for Global Child Health, Sick Children, Sick Child. You will hear new research from Nadia Akse, Director of Research with Modern Scientists Global. Nadia will be showing us the economic impact of stunting to businesses in low and middle income countries. Data, we hope, will provide a compelling case for why businesses should engage. You'll join a panel dialogue with our expert speakers. And today, we have Simruti Govan, Director Corporate Responsibility with PVH Corporation, Carla Hillhorst, Executive Vice President R&D, Food and Refreshments at Unilever, Mira Shikar, Global Nutrition Lead with the World Bank, and Shajan Thomas, Head of Sustainability and Nuts Business in Vietnam with all our food ingredients. Our panelists will be discussing success stories, practical experiences, and opportunities for greater private sector action in addressing undernutrition. We actively encourage our audience to ask questions that our panelists can address during the final 45 minutes of this session. You can add your questions to the Q&A and you can use the chat to introduce yourself and to contribute to this conversation. Now I'd like to hand you over to our moderator for today's session, my colleague, Kerry Wozni, the Associate Director Monitoring and Evaluation at the Power of Nutrition, who will lead us through the rest of this session. It's a pleasure to have you all today and I hope you enjoy this session. Kerry, over to you. Thank you, Salim. Um, my name is Kerry Wozni. I'm the Associate Director of Monitoring and Evaluation at the Power of Nutrition, and I'm delighted to moderate this panel today. Um, as we know, the private sector is incredibly important in shaping nutrition globally. This can be seen easily for food and beverage companies, which play a role in the accessibility of nutritious foods, for example, through fortification or shaping consumer behavior, but also in the private sector broadly. Supportive breastfeeding policies, for example, can enable mothers to give their children the best start. Sufficient wages can, can support employees to afford a nutritious diet. And workplace nutrition programs can ensure employees are able to eat well while at work. Apologies, I didn't realize my video was off. 
Um, despite this, research from Gates Ventures Stunting Exemplars shows that there is a dearth of data on the role of the private sector in reducing stunting in key countries. Moreover, previous research conducted by Chatham House illustrated that businesses did not believe poor nutrition was um, substant substantively affecting their organizations, either um, due to believing that the rates of malnutrition where they are operating are low, or that specifically their employees were unlikely to suffer from undernutrition. Results from new research presented later today has estimated these losses for the private sector due to childhood stunting. Our discussion today highlights the private sector's role in improving nutrition globally, from potential avenues or roles in supporting nutrition and going beyond investing in nutrition as a moral good, estimating the financial losses to the private sector due to a poorly nourished workforce and the potential return on investment for supporting nutrition initiatives. Our first presenter hardly needs an introduction. Professor Zulfi Buddha is a prolific world-leading expert in child health and nutrition. One of his many contributions to nutrition is leading the stunting exemplars work at Gates Ventures. Um, and then after Zulfi, Nadia Axier, who is the, um, who is the, Sorry, Nadia. Uh, Nadia Xier, who won the Canadian Woman Leader in Global Health Award in 2008 from the Lancet and the Government of Canada, the Emerging Public Health Leader in 2019 from the University of Toronto, and just this year was voted Canada's top 20 dynamic CEOs um, for her organization, Modern Scientist Global, where she is the CEO. Um, I'd like to pass over to Zulfi now uh, to lead us through the stunting exemplars work. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kerry, and wonderful. Uh, so my task is principally to set the scene for some of the discussion that I hope will emerge from this fantastic panel uh, around what could be done for stunting, for example, uh, in many low and middle income countries. So if you could go to the next slide. Uh, to this particular audience, um, the stunting exemplars work is fairly well known. It's been extensively presented. And in a nutshell, this looked at the possibility that some countries who had made progress remarkably over and above what their economic improvement over time may have indicated, offer examples that others could emulate over time. So in other words, positive deviance work in those countries based on not only solid quantitative data in country, but also on a, a robust qualitative analysis of policies, programs, and stakeholders' assessments. And in this project in the first phase, we've looked at five countries in great detail and, and work is underway in an additional five of which three have been completed. So overall, the exemplars now represent a broad experience across a large number of countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, in the first phase from the published data that we have, next slide, uh, what was remarkable was to recognize that many countries had achieved progress with average rates of reduction in stunting exceeding two to 3% per annum um, through a mixture and a diverse range of interventions, which here in this particular graphic are shown for the first five countries uh, in various color-coded stacked bars. So you will note that although about half of all uh, progress in these countries was achieved through direct and indirect nutrition and health interventions. There were a number of interventions outside of these two sectors, which previously we would label as nutrition sensitive interventions that contributed to progress. And that depended a lot also on the underlying baseline conditions that these countries had encountered. So for example, if you look at the Kyrgyz Republic, you see a disproportionate contribution of economic improvement and poverty reduction uh, to the reduction in stunting compared to countries like Nepal or Ethiopia, where this is a, a much greater contribution in relative terms through the health and nutrition sectors. Uh, and that's partly because many of those primary care indicators in Kyrgyzstan were already quite high and uh, until the economic depreciation that took place post-independence led to a significant reduction in nutrition, food security, and increase in stunting. Uh, so these examples across these diverse range of countries put forward a very simple 
straightforward recognition that you require a multi-sectoral approach, number one, to addressing nutrition in the medium to long term, and that you also require that multi-sectoral approach through uh, interventions that have to do with food security, agriculture, improvements in education, women's empowerment, and living condition, environmental health. And in particular, I'd like to point out that even though randomized controlled trials may not show so, certainly our exemplar work shows the importance of investments in WASH at, at country level. Next slide. If you could uh, look at all of this evidence together, as we have put uh, together, and please go on and show the entire set of the framework that we developed, the 10-point framework, it started off with appropriate diagnostics and uh, the use of data at granular level at sub, uh, subnational considerations to prioritization of interventions at scale. And once again, you will see that these 10 recommendations all fall into the direct, indirect health and non-health sector interventions. I'd like to particularly address the issue of how one can address food insecurity and reach marginalized population, where in particular we felt the role of the private sector in many of these countries was paramount. It was very important that we had adequate sources and in the nutrition and food system availability of commodities, whether they be fortified um, uh, staples or fortified foods or other specialized products to our use in pregnancy, young children and infants uh, at scale. Next slide. So the take home messages from the exemplars work so far uh, strongly support the cross-sectoral, multi-sectoral collaboration as a fundamental underpinning of country level decision-making process. And, and this is why in particular, the role of, of the bank is so important in addressing this through its investment strategies in countries. And I'd like to point out the phenomenal leadership that Mira Shekhar herself has provided in making that a, a cornerstone of nutrition policies in many low and middle income countries. On the private sector, we also recognize that although there is this recognition from these country exemplars work, it is largely underutilized. And, and many, in many instances, the private sector in these countries hits way below its weight. And that will be the subject of some of my discussion over the next few slides. Um, we also noted that in many countries, progress could be made much faster had they utilized some of these approaches to achieve greater equitable access of food distribution and commodities to populations at greatest risk. And, and we also recognize the important role in certain countries of this becoming a strategy under the remit of conditional cash transfers, where some of those conditionalities could also be coupled with nutrition and food products as is happening in the ASAS Nashwanawa program in Pakistan. So let's go to these three country examples and specifically note those. So when you take Nepal, for example, uh, as the work <clears throat> undertaken recently by, uh, um, by Modern Scientist Global indicates, uh, the private sector is pretty strong. Uh, when you look at service delivery in the health sector, uh, the vast majority of hospital beds are in the private sector. Uh, around two thirds of physicians uh, work in those circumstances. Education sector is increasingly important in the private schools, which also represent um, uh, a significant proportion of the population. And a large proportion of Nepal's population in the agriculture sector also works in the private sector, where there is opportunity for greater engagement in supporting the food and, and, and uh, nutrition system. So providing appropriate nutritious foods to appropriate agriculture practices and perhaps through food commodities that can be fortified is a low hanging fruit in this region where micronutrient deficiencies are so rampant. Moving on to Ethiopia, um, uh, you find a similar contribution of the private sector across all levels of the health sector in Ethiopia. And there has been a phenomenal increase in this in 2007, not to take away from the important role of the health extension workers, which are largely in the public sector in providing some level of equity in the distribution of services. Um, but the private sector in Ethiopia is largely fragmented. And, and in this, this could be the legacy of the political system that's still, still evolving uh, and its market share is 
is relatively small, about a fifth. But the government has recognized the private sector's importance, and uh, particularly in sectors of education and agriculture, um, there is increasing recognition of the important role that the private sector can play in terms of improving quality and quantity. And as our stunting exemplars work indicated, a lot of Ethiopia's improvement in stunting stemmed also from investments in agriculture and an improved food production at, at local level. And this could also be the wedge that opens the door for greater economic and public health gains in Ethiopia, provided they can overcome some of the current challenges that they have of conflict, insecurity, and, and lack of investments. Finally, when you come to the country that I know best uh, in Pakistan, I will not say much about the private sector in healthcare and others, which is responsible for about two thirds to three quarters of all services over, but I will talk about the industry sector in Pakistan, the food uh, sector in particular, which is rapidly growing and also now beginning to exert its muscle in terms of what it can do to improve uh, nutrition and food commodities. Uh, this industrial sector is robust. It already uh, produces a lot of value added products. Uh, and while there are negative examples also with a very robust uh, a food sector that is focused on profits with the growth and the production of uh, uh, sugary, sugary drinks and other uh, commodities. There is also the recognition that it contributes to the production of indigenous fortified foods. And there are lots of examples of this at commodity level. So iodized salt is all produced in country uh, and iron fortified wheat products are also produced and they're slowly making their way up in the system. But you find that for certain things like milk, um, this is almost entirely fortified in the private sector and increasingly replacing uh, the commodities that used to be available through just local vendors. Uh, and these initiatives are now beginning to make their way into the public sector programs. I've talked about ready to use therapeutic foods for the management of children who are severely malnourished and the ready to use supplementary foods which are being used at scale for maternal and moderate malnutrition. Uh, in the ASAS National Noir program with a 10 district pilot that they initiated about two years ago, uh, this now depends upon this in the local industry, local produced supply of commodities and the government has just decided to expand it to all districts of Pakistan uh, and, uh, and also have an additional private sector strategy to have these commodities potentially available outside of the public sector programs also. Uh, but there are clearly greater uh, scope for enhancement uh, through social marketing strategies and innovations that can also reach out to adolescent girls, school-age children, and, and through stakeholders that can help sustain this through philanthropy and local support, local financing. So we are very cognizant that this might be a beginning of a food revolution and a revolution in terms of private sector's engagement with a major public sector program in Pakistan and helping reduce nutrition in the medium to, uh, under nutrition, the medium to short term in Pakistan. So thank you very much for your time. I'd like to now cede the floor to my colleague, Dr. Nadia Atsir. Thank you, Zulfi. And hello, everybody. Nice to be here with you today. Um, so I'm going to present some of the data that we have generated through our cost of stunting project um, that was done in collaboration with the Power Nutrition and Modern Scientists Global with funding from the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. Next slide, please. Um, so just to point out, uh, you know, the goal of this research was really, as, as Dr. Prita uh, alluded to and, and uh, Carrie as well, to try to understand what are the costs of stunting? We know stunting is a big problem in low and middle income countries, but what is the cost of stunting to the private sector um, firms and also the private sector workforce in low and middle income countries? Can we quantify that? And, and what is that, that entity or that quantity? Um, and once we do quantify it, what are the potential gains if stunting levels are reduced? So what are the returns on investment um, if, if we actually go ahead and try to reduce stunting levels? So our study went ahead and did this for all low and middle income countries where we had uh, good data. 
So we were able to produce uh, estimates for up to 123 low and middle income countries that represented six global regions. Uh, our analyses have been uh, produced for the global regions by country, by firm size, including micro, small, medium and large size firms, by sector and by gender as well. Um, where possible, we produced estimates for all known middle income countries and did detailed analyses for a core set of countries for which we had longitudinal or birth cohort data sets available. And these countries are Peru, Vietnam, Ethiopia, India, Tanzania, Philippines, and Brazil. So a nice representation of countries uh, around the world. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show you some of our results, but just wanted to flag that the findings we have here are likely an underestimate because we did use conservative approaches all throughout, which is sort of typical of these kind of economic modeling exercises. Um, and it's likely that the actual costs of stenting are even greater. Next slide, please. Just one slide on our approach. Um, so I'll quickly go through this. We did focus on low and middle income countries where the, uh, the burden of stenting is highest. We used a range of different uh, research activities to study this question. So we did systematic scoping and target liter targeted literature reviews. We engaged a global panel of experts uh, representing many different uh, disciplines and industries. We analyzed longitudinal birth cohort data sets, um, the seven that I mentioned, but then also firm level data from 110 low and middle income countries. These were the enterprise surveys that are collected by the World Bank. Our approach in general was to analyze the pathways of stunting to outcomes, so the exposures and the outcomes, um, so, you know, and the impact stunting has on um, things such as cognition, education, and adult height, and how that ultimately uh, has an impact on income and wage losses. We focused on analyses, um, so two sets of analyses, and I'll show those to you today. The, the effect or the impact of stunting on wage losses to the worker, the private sector worker, and then also to the private firm as a whole. Um, in terms of statistical approaches, we did comparative analyses using traditional frequentist statistics, which is you know, the, the usual way of analyzing data. Um, but then we also did analyses using Bayesian inference models and AI-based machine learning models using cloud-based platforms such as Amazon Web Services through the Cloudera, uh, Cloudera data platform. And in terms of producing economic models, we use uh, labor economics and health and uh, nutrition economic modeling um, to estimate the return on investment. Next slide, please. So what did we find? Um, overall, we found that across 90 low and middle income countries for which we had good data, um, that represented six global regions, childhood stunting cost the private sector at least $135 billion a year. And this number is upwards of, sorry, excuse me one second. Sorry about that. And this number is upwards of 264 or $265 billion annually if we use the, the less conservative estimate. The losses were greatest in Latin America and Caribbean countries, and also the countries in East Asia and Pacific. And countries with the greatest losses, some of them are listed there. These are um, estimated as a function of sales and the number of workers and the stunting penalty that uh, accumulates over time. Um, some of the countries with the greatest losses were China, uh, which lost about $58 billion annually in revenue in the private sector due to stunting, Peru, Brazil, Mexico and others that you see listed there. When we amalgamated this up to a proportion of the national GDP across the 90 countries, um, about 0.01% up to 10% of national GDP was lost um, or, or revenue was lost um, due to stunting in the private sector. Next slide, please. I wanted to show here some of the data for the three countries that Zulfi touched on. So Ethiopia and Nepal were stunting exemplar countries in that they reduced stunting significantly over time. But as Zulfi pointed out, you know, their, their levels of stunting are still quite high between 30 to 40 percent. And much more can be done if the private sector was mobilized. And then Pakistan is a context you know, that um, hasn't done so well in reducing stunting at a national level, but has had some national gains and does have much potential for improving nutrition um, through you know, active investments and, and um, various activities that the, the government is moving forward at present. So looking at these three countries, we can see some of the figures that our study has produced here. Um, for Ethiopia, the average annual losses in sales, this is in USD in millions, 
um, for a, a private firm or totals that are private firms is about 272 million. And you know, this goes as high as 754 million in Nepal. Um, and then for Pakistan, it's about 175 million. And looking at what percent that is a, a, as a proportion of national GDP in Ethiopia, that's about 0.4% of the national GDP lost uh, due to stunting. And then it's, it's as high as 3.9% in Nepal. Next slide, please. Here we show some of the costs to specific sectors. Um, I'm showing you results by region, but we also do have results by country in our paper. Um, which is which I'll talk about in you know at the end is also available for download uh, presently. But looking at the results by region here, we can see that um, so these these data show what is the average cost or the loss in revenue to an average size private firm in these countries. And this is across uh, micro, small, medium, and large size firm. What is on average the loss to that firm? And one thing that immediately jumps out at you is that there is losses um, across all sectors. And there is huge variation uh, across sectors and across regions. Um, so while the impact on sectors does vary by country and region, generally we can see, um, if we were to synthesize across these, that the greatest losses are for the food, garment, and manufacturing sectors um, across regions, and the least losses are for retail. And there's much more nuance to this um, when we examine this by country. Next slide, please. So let's focus in on the individual now. So we've seen what stunting costs the private firm, but what about the individual who works in that private firm? Here, we've been able to produce estimates for 123 low and middle income countries. And we found that the individual private sector worker loses between $31 and $1,736 USD in income annually due to stunting. And at the national level, these losses are in the billions. Um, so you can see the estimates there by region. In our paper, we do have these by country. And so for instance, in South Asia, we can see that the entire private sector workforce is losing about $28 billion of income. So that's potential income to these individuals who work in the private sector that is lost because they were stunted um, and the stunting had an impact on what they were able to achieve across their life course. Um, so that's 20, $28 billion in South Asia, and that figure is as high as $198 billion of income lost in East Asia and the Pacific. Next slide, please. Again, looking at these three countries. Um, so here we have a table for uh, Ethiopia, Nepal, and Pakistan, and I'm showing you the average monthly income lost in the first column per stunted worker. So in Ethiopia, on average, a private sector worker is losing between $9 and $21 uh, of income. And you know, that figure is between $20 to $29 and $18 to $26 in Pakistan. When we look at um, the monthly income loss for entire private sector workforce in the country, this is in USD millions. The figures you know, are, are quite high. So in Ethiopia, about $214 to $475 million are lost monthly in income. And in Pakistan, that number is extremely high between 620 and $885 million uh, lost uh, for the total private sector workforce. When we look at this annually, the numbers are high up in the figures. Uh, so high up in the figures are high up in the billions. So this is important because the you know, amount of money available for workers at their disposal um, is used for really for their sustenance, for, for them to improve their living conditions, to buy better foods that are nutrient dense, to access better education and access to healthcare. Um, and without this money, this perpetual cycle of malnutrition and poverty and poor living conditions will continue. And it may seem like, for instance, in Ethiopia, $9 lost a month is not a lot of money, but when on average, an individual is earning $50 per month as their salary, then losing $9 to $21 is a significant chunk of income to lose uh, for an individual purely due to stunting um, at, during childhood. Next slide, please. The good news is um, something can be done and there is a, um, an important return on investment that happens if one wants to invest in a, a set of key interventions for reducing stunting. Um, so we've done this analysis for the seven low and middle income countries where we had the birth cohort data sets uh, because we could actually track the individual from 
from birth um, throughout the life course to where they end up working in the workforce and their wages and so on. So for these individuals, we've been able to estimate that investing in stunting reduction today in an under five child can yield economic returns ranging from 100% of the investment back to 8,100% for every $1 invested across the child's uh, employment lifespan. So this is 30 to 40 years. This, these figures include only direct nutrition interventions, so the ones that I've identified um, in the table on the right, and these are the ones for which there's good cost and effect size estimates available globally. Um, but just wanted to point out, and as Sophie pointed out as well, there is a huge impact of uh, on stunting from nutrition sensitive or indirect interventions. Unfortunately, we could not estimate those because the data is not available to do so. Um, but if investments were aid, uh, made in those areas, there could be even greater dividends um, on, on the return on investment. Next slide, please. Looking at some of, yeah, next slide, please. Have you moved to the next slide? Hi, Nadia, I think there might be a technical issue. Um, can you just hold on one minute while we yeah. while we sort it? Sorry. Okay, apologies to everyone. Um, we are just, uh, our, the, the person who's controlling the slides is just rejoining now. Great, thanks, Valentina. Um, Nadia, are, are you ready to begin again? Yes, thank you. And next slide, please. Great. Um, so here uh, we've shown you the return on investment estimates for the seven countries where we've been able to produce these. Um, and you can see there is variation across country. Uh, just wanted to point out the findings for Ethiopia, for instance, um, return on investment for every $1 invested in stunting reduction, the return on investment can be $12 to $26, depending on which parameters we use. Uh, regardless, huge returns there. Um, and you know these figures can be as high as $37 to $81, like we see for Vietnam down at the bottom. Next slide, please. So I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes digging deeper into Ethiopia, um, into one sector, just so we can really bring some of these data to life and understand um, you know, what it is that we're saying and what is the potential impact and, and action we can take on this. So in Ethiopia, we've seen now with the data that I've shown that childhood stunting caused, uh, cost the private firms in Ethiopia to lose a minimum of 272 million in revenue uh, annually, which is about 0.42% of their GDP. And this can go up to about 0.7% uh, of GDP. We do see that the food and garment sectors have the highest revenue losses. And you can see that in the figures below um, for an average firm across the different sizes of firms uh, in the country for an average firm in that sector, the food sector is losing about 17,000 um, dollars USD. This is for an average size firm and the garment sector about 19,000 or a little bit more than that. Um, so huge losses there and some of the other firm size firm, uh, some of the other sectors have uh, significant losses, but, but less than the food and garment sector. So digging deeper into the garment sector, next slide please. What is going on in the garment sector in Ethiopia? So here's a little bit of context. 
Ethiopia's private sector does not have a minimum wage, and the garment sector workers are paid on average about $50 USD per month. Um, and this figure can go as low as $26 um, from other sources, but we're going with the higher number here. Um, so let's say the average private sector worker in the, in, um, in the garment sector is earning about $50 per month. This is a very low amount, especially in comparison to uh, other countries. So in South Africa, garment workers, for instance, are earning $244 per month, and in Kenya, about $207. Um, so very low earnings in Ethiopia. Our analysis has found that stunted workers in Ethiopia's private sector are on average 4.2 centimeters shorter, have 1.2 years fewer years of education, and about 0.4 standard deviations loss or 20% loss in cognition compared to those that are not stunted. Um, so huge implications that stunting has on their physical and cognitive potential for these private sector workers. Um, we found that across all sectors, the private sector workers in Ethiopia who are stunted in childhood lose between $6 and $9.2 in income per month. So if we, we take the $50 average per month, um, you know, these garment workers who are already learning, a, already earning a low wage are losing between 12 to 18 percent of their monthly salary due to stunting. Next slide, please. Who are these workers? So in Ethiopia, in the garment sector, um, the majority of the workers are female, 85%. They're on average 23 years of age. Uh, more than half of them are the family breadwinner, um, supporting an average household size of up to three people. About 60% achieve the equivalent of a 12th grade uh, level of education. And this textile manufacturing is a, is a significant source of employment for women in this context. Um, and you can see some of the jobs that they typically do, sewing machine operators, um, uh, followed by production and other types of roles. Um, and, you know, majority of them do have a permanent contract to do this. Next slide. So given this profile of the garment sector workforce, you know, and income loss is ranging from 12 to 18 percent, um, we can see that childhood stunting can severely deprive an already at-risk group. And the human, social, and financial capital deprivation of these women affects not only themselves, but also their children and their families. Um, and unfortunately, this cycle of poverty and malnutrition is, will continue to be perpetuated by pathways such as poor diets, um, poor household living conditions, greater disease, lower access, access to healthcare and utilization because of uh, the lower purchasing power and income potential of these women from these families. Next slide, please. The good news is there could be um, significant returns on investing in nutrition and in, especially in Ethiopia's garment sector, which is rapidly growing. Um, data does show that there's an opportunity for businesses to invest in stenting reduction today so that the short and long-term adverse consequences to the worker, her family and community can be mitigated. Some of the short-term benefits include better health and nutrition of the worker, her family and her child, and this can result in less disease. Of course, higher workforce productivity, which is attractive to the, the firms themselves, um, since the worker can have improved absenteeism and presenteeism. And the long-term benefits are some of the ones that we've shown today. Improved human capital for the country as a whole, for every $1 invested in the stunting reduction interventions in Ethiopia, we can have economic, economic returns of up to $25, so huge um, uh, uh, economic potential there for the country overall. Um, and you know, the cost of introducing the Lancet's recommended package of interventions, the one that I showed you, is about $121 per child in Ethiopia. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to end here. I hope that this, uh, this set of slides gave you a nice teaser into our study um, and some good data to reflect on. Just wanted to point out that our paper is currently under review um, and we're aiming for publication at some point in early 2022. Uh, however, you can access our pre-peer review paper, uh, the preprints with the Lancet, which are currently online um, and they're available at that link below. Um, and so you can download the full paper and, you know, just start reviewing and, and thinking about these, um, these data. Just wanted to flag it in that they are preliminary and, you know, potentially could change um, after peer review. And I will stop there. Thank you. I'll hand it back to Carrie. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, Nadia and Sophie, for your incredible and thought-provoking presentations. It's great to see both the potential of the private sector and financial motivations for the private sector to act. 
I'd like to ask two of our panelists, Shijan and Carla, how could this new data on the impact of stunting um, motivate um, investments in nutrition? Uh, Shijan, would you like to answer? He's muted. Um, Shajan, I think oh, okay. you're muted if you're stuck. Great. Yeah, yeah. I opened it. Okay, then. So what's useful about this new data is how it focuses specifically on childhood stunning and importance of really consider how the well-being of children in the communities where we operate is directly related to the future well-being of their business. This is certainly in the case of factories where the evidence shows that it is an important business case where workforce nutrition, but it is also the case in farming, farming communities when we look at the agricultural sector. If you are planning long-term action improve, action improve nutrition in the workforce, needs to meet, needs to meet the equal efforts from multi-sector partnership to prevent stunning in the children as this is essential to breaking the intergener intergenerational cyclic cycle of malnutrition. As the number shows, childhood stunning as a huge cost with its largely irreversible cognitive and physical consequences. As a business that plans to run efficiently for next 30, 50 years and beyond, private should be team up and the government's a team up with governments and NGOs to help prevent malnutrition among children and the communities where they operate. I am assuring you that this is a down this is a down payment for, on future productivity. So thank you. Thank you, Sajan. I really like um, the description of being a down payment on future productivity. That's great. Um, Carla, would you be able to uh, give some thoughts as well? Yes, of course, and thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me uh, in this panel. And thank you also uh, for sharing uh, this data. It's very, uh, very interesting. Um, and it's also particularly interesting that the, um, the food industry is one of the highest impacted uh, as a result of uh, childhood stunting. Um, I do believe that the research is to a certain extent an affirmation of the thinking that we have in Unilever that we want to do well by doing good. So if you kind of uh, focus on, on this space, then on one hand, you can have a social impact, uh, but actually immediately you have a business impact. So that's exactly the type of sweet spot uh, where we like to operate because I you know it, on one hand, you if it's your own workers, employees related, the productivity will go up. And at the same time, for us as a, a food industry, uh, the moment the spending power of a consumer goes up, that's of course also good uh, for our business. So I think it's it's an area where uh, we should be able as a private sector to definitely find the sweet spot. And a few things I would like to add, you know, the um, I guess many people will know that the purpose of Unilever is to make sustainable living a commonplace. And within that, uh, we have uh, made a commitment also in the context of nutrition for growth to double the number of products that are delivering positive nutrition by 2025. And I think uh, fortification is going to be a big component uh, of that. Uh, I don't need to convince the audience here that it is a very economic way of uh, delivering uh, uh, nutritional needs to consumers. Um, but we're also having quite a number of programs running in the area of workforce nutrition, and especially for uh, people that are more vulnerable in the supply chain. So we have multi-year programs running for our tea estate workers, where we also work together um, with many other partners, uh, knowing that you know doing this alone will make us less effective. Uh, and, uh, and those multi-year programs, they do really have an impact on the diversity of the diet and the quality of the diet uh, that our workers are, um, are consumer, consuming. And then I think the last point is, uh, and I think it is a bit linked to um, 
to the research that was presented is that we actually realized that it's, you know, it's not only the fortification or the, 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 the nutrient needs, but also the underlying uh, causes where we have to, uh, uh, to contribute to, um, which is in the area of, of a living wage or an income. Uh, and uh, we are working at the moment to ensure that everyone who directly provides goods and services to us uh, across our value chain, uh, including smallholder farmers for key crops like cocoa and palm, will earn a living wage within a decade. So we are aiming for that uh, by 2030. And I think by doing, you know, uh, positive nutrition, fortification, workforce nutrition, but also tackling this underlying um, issue of uh, people having a living wage, uh, we hope that we can contribute significantly to, uh, to uh, bringing this to a higher level. Great, thank you so much, Carla. It's amazing to hear of Unilever's commitment to um, not only the immediate uh, causes of malnutrition, but the um, you know, more distal causes as well. Um, and great to hear about those commitments at, at Nutrition for Growth too. Um, it's been really useful to see this important evidence gap filled about the cost of stunting to the private sector. Sylvie's presentation illuminated potential opportunities and further aid data gaps. Mira and Shmruti, which additional data, evidence, or activities do you feel could help incentivize business investment in nutrition programs? And are there any challenges you feel we'll still face? Um, Mira, if you'd like to respond first, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you very much, um, uh, Harry. And, and a big, big thank you to Nadia. Really, what you've shared with us today is groundbreaking work. Uh, for many, many years, decades, in fact, we, when I say we, that's one finger, three fingers pointing right back at me, I'm not pointing at anybody else. Uh, we in the nutrition community have really focused on the global public good. We focused on how improving nutrition will help countries uh, improve their national productivity. And those are great arguments. And I'm glad that it's helped to move the agenda with national governments, and that was necessary, but it wasn't sufficient. I think we know that the private sector has a huge role to play, and the evidence that you presented today really helps to move that agenda forward. Um, not just, and I really like, Nadia, how you presented not just the costs to private firms, which is absolutely critical, but also the costs to individuals as a personal wisdom. So uh, this is really, for, in my mind, a, a really groundbreaking piece of work. Um, and, and you know, for many, uh, for some year, recent years, we've heard from the private sector and we heard from Carla just now, um, the CEOs saying, we want to do, we want to go beyond our bottom line. We want to do good as well. Well, now you've given them evidence that they can improve their bottom line and at the same time um, do good as well, the sweet spot that Carla, you, you spoke about. Um, so if this won't convince them, then I don't know what will convince the private sector to jump in. Because um, ultimately the private sector is responsible for the bottom line and we need to recognize that and help them achieve the bottom line, but also achieve the sweet spot. In terms of um, challenges, there are many. And I think the first biggest challenge is that we as researchers speak in our research speak. And that's important to get the credibility of to behind the numbers that you presented, Nadia. But we need to take the next step to be able to communicate this to a private sector audience and even to a lay person. If we are talking about private goods for an individual, we need to be able to speak to the average person on the street and be able to share with them what they are losing if they don't invest in the nutrition space. And, and the, you know, our, our decomposition analysis and our detailed uh, re regression analysis are really helpful for us, but I'm not sure they're always helpful for the, for the wider um, community. And I say that from personal experience, when I joined the bank, the World Bank uh, 20 years ago, 
Um, I was one of um, three uh, or two nutritionists in the bank, and I had been trained in nutrition and epidemiology. So I had to, and nobody wanted to hear my language. So I had to learn the language of the economists because I was speaking to 10,000 plus economists. And that to me was really important in getting that message across to this thing. Um, so biggest uh, challenge is reaching new audiences. And we're learning that if we reach new audiences, we can actually achieve lots of new things. Um, just to give you an example uh, from the World Bank side, uh, we are now um, quote unquote selling IBRD bonds uh, or World Bank bonds to life insurance companies in, in Japan, in Tokyo. So getting a very different part of the private sector engaged in this. And Nadia, your research helps to do that as well. Really moves the agenda beyond the food sector to the wider private sector uh, as well. Um, in terms of more research, there's plenty more that needs to be done, but I think this is an absolutely great start. It would be good to do something like this on the over overweight obesity um, side as well, uh, because there too, the, the private sector has a big role to play. Let me stop there. I can go on forever. What wonderful and great congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. That was um, really great to hear your comments. I think especially thinking about how to adequately communicate to different audiences is, is incredibly important. Um, and I think also uh, speaking of overweight and obesity, um, you know, when you think of stunting, it also increases the risk factor for overweight and obesity later in life, which might also multiply the um, effects that Nadia presented earlier. Um, Smriti, would you also like to comment? Yes, thank you, Karen. And thank you, Mira, as well. Um, I would say that, I mean, demonstrating, of course, the short term gains of investing in nutrition programs and the business impacts of these programs would be really impactful. And that's, of course, building off of the amazing research that Nadia has, has conducted. Um, so thank you again for that. Um, I think another critical piece um, that could really be helpful is demonstrating how investments in nutrition related interventions should be defined and better integrated into the social component or the S part of ESG, as well as guidance as to how to best report out on these interventions in alignment with investor demands and needs and global reporting standards. Additionally, I think um, what could be helpful as well are some stronger linkages between undernutrition and the impacts on purchasing power or bu buying and spending potential for consumers. Um, as well as stronger integration of women's health and nutritional needs into diversity inclusion efforts as well within the workplace. Um, and as far as challenges that we still face, I, I, I do agree with, with, uh, uh, with Dr. Um, Mira as well as in, in just terms of communicating to the business audience um, and, and really taking all this amazing research and, and making sure that it's tailored uh, to the, to the um, needs and, and priorities of, of the private sector as well. Great, thank you very much, Smriti. Um, that was really, that was really great. Um, and I think also when thinking about the, um, the short-term gains, it's, you know, kind of tied into the communication part that you said, that it might be something that is, um, you know, more useful for immediate action uh, for corporate. So it'll be great to follow up with further research there. Um, I'd like to open it up just to see if any of the other panelists have any comments here. No? Okay, great. Um, and although there are data gaps on the impact of private sector supported nutrition programs as a whole, there are many great examples of these types of programs. I'd like to ask um, our panelists who work at multinational corporations, so Jan, Carla, and Schmidty, could you each give us one or two examples of programs that your organization supports? And uh, I'd like to start with Shajan. Thank you, Gary. So I would like to introduce three examples in our nuts business we have introduced. First of all, I'm starting with Vietnam. In Vietnam, our edible nuts business have pioneered work on supporting breastfeeding mothers, a newly established spaces and equipments 
made available for more than 2,500 emplo women employees. The important, since we know that the female workers who are supported and encouraged by their colleagues and have access to breastfeeding spaces at work, more than two times, more than two times likely to continue breastfeeding than those who, are, who do not. Beyond the direct health benefits, the women there and their children, the research shows that the, by increasing the breastfeeding rates globally, the world could save nearly $1 billion per day on, on medical costs, human, um, in human losses, and labor productivity. So in that aspect, Vietnam could save around 270 billion VND per day. And second case, I am talking about in Ivory Coast. In our cashew business in Ivory Coast, for the second year, partnered with the government national nutrition program and their partners like UNICEF and Helen Keller International and others to support the distribution of vitamin A supplements and deworming virobolus to the children under the age of five, as well as screen the acute malnutrition of these children. In the districts where our cashew farmers are reside, we helped to reach them, some million children with the essential nutrition support. The partners provided the SPT and the supplies, while our field extension network helped to mobilize the communities, ensure the people were aware of the free support, why the importance and why could they access? Why how could they access it? As well as help it to the actual distribution. And in third case, in our cashew industry in Andhra Pradesh, India, we partnered with Gain under their Keeping Food Markets Working Program to provide support food system to the workers in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic. The support has been form of nutritious food cartons of 200 vulnerable workers, 2,000 vulnerable, vulnerable workers to help boost access to consumption of micronutrient-rich food during the period where access of food has been disrupted and consumption of healthy diets are more important. Distributions were also complements eradication of nutrition, healthy eating. Distribution of this also complemented with education on nutrition and healthy eating and protection from COVID-19. So what, what, can, what can others learn from these examples? The private sector could, shouldn't need to do all the answers of improving nutrition or even spend a lot of money. But we can leverage our strength like large extension of footprints and relationship with the communities such as the example that Ivory Coast I have spoken right now. You don't need to do everything elsewhere at once. Start small, make plan, gradually build on it year on year basis. The Workforce Nutrition Scorecard and Workforce Nutrition Alliance, Workforce Nutrition Scorecard of the Work Nutrition Alliance is the great tool for mapping the baseline and keep, keep key opportunities for the improvement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sujan. I really like um, the idea to start small and build up and to not be responsible for doing everything at once. Um, and also great to hear about the Workforce Nutrition Scorecard and using data to inform um, your actions. Uh, Carla, would you like to tell us about some of Unilever's programs? Yes, of course. And uh, uh, there are very nice examples that you've just shared. So uh, very nice to hear from that. And uh, we can always learn from each other. So yeah, I would like to give also three examples. And you ask for two, you get three, you know. Um, and um, there is one is in the area of product formulation, the other education. And the third one is uh, beyond. Uh, food actually uh, going, going even wider. So starting with uh, product reformulation, I think I already mentioned that uh, fortification is, is clearly an option. Um, you know, we have products in our portfolio uh, that are being consumed almost on a daily basis uh, and also have quite a wide reach. So then you need to think about, uh, for instance, a bouillon powder or bouillon cubes uh, that people are using or certain uh, soy sauce, for instance, that we have in Indonesia. So 
products that are very good vehicles uh, for fortification because people consume them on a very regular basis. And we are already um, uh, delivering something like 125 billion servings of fortified food, uh, fortified servings a day products, uh, and aiming to increase that to about 200 billion by uh, 2022. Um, so there's a lot happening there. Um, what you see, and you know, it's the R&D person speaking. Sometimes um, people underestimate uh, how easy it is. Um, sometimes it is, by the way, but sometimes it isn't. Because when you're adding certain fortificants, it can impact the taste of the product, or it, it can really uh, impact the color of the product, or you use uh, a component that's no longer bioavailable. So you do need to do the proper R&D to make sure that the product is still tasty, but that also the nutritional impacts of that fortificant is, uh, is delivered. Um, then education. Um, I would like to give an example here. Um, we have fortified our uh, bullion powder in, um, uh, in Indonesia, Royco, uh, with iodine. And we know that about 40% of pregnant women in Indonesia have a deficiency on iodine. And I don't think I need to explain to this community that it is incredibly important nutrient for, uh, for development. Um, so we've, we've kind of done that fortification, which is relatively easy to do using iodized salt. But then we said we need to do more. So we set up an education program called Nutri Menu, where we are educating uh, mothers of the importance of a, um, a diverse diet and the importance of certain nutrients within that. And we complement that with a, a recipe type of menu to also get people into a certain behavior change. So education to really drive uh, a behavior change. And we worked together with uh, seven global NGOs uh, under uh, Mother Baby Iodine to also help increase the awareness of how important iodine is. Uh, so by increasing the awareness, you also get the traction. And I think that's a nice example where working together with others is really creating a multiplier. And you know, this whole area of nutrition is complex enough. I think collaboration is only getting faster. And I think the third example is beyond uh, food, um, which is again, you know, we are running a number of uh, behavior change and education programs in the area of hand washing uh, in multiple uh, countries. Um, because uh, if you can reduce diarrhea, uh, that has multiple impacts. It, uh, it, it means that uh, people will uh, improve in terms of their nutrition uptake, uh, but also absence from schools, for instance, uh, is, is uh, much improved. So I think you can also think beyond uh, those type of, uh, of programs where you look at the, at the diet. So those would be three examples to share, uh, Gary. Thank you so much, Carla. And uh, definitely, I think the uh, WASH interventions that you're discussing really mirror what the evidence that Zulfi presented um, was in reducing other nutrition through investing in WASH. Um, Shmuti, would you also like to present um, some examples from PVA? Sure, thank you, Carrie. And uh, thank you, Carla and Shajan, for those very inspirational examples as well. Um, I think we have so much to learn from each other. Um, so we at PVH are very proud to have partnered with The Power of Nutrition this past May to track tackle undernutrition in the garment sector by introducing essential services and support for working mothers and pregnant women in our factories and districts in Bangladesh, where undernutrition rates are the highest. Um, so through this partnership, we aim to um, uh, be a part of a broader four-year, $15 million national program through which UNICEF Bangladesh, as well as the International Labor Organization's Mothers at Work program is supporting the government of Bangladesh to address current gaps in nutrition and in interventions and to prevent maternal malnutrition, improve the nutrition of children, as well as ensure care for low birth weight infants. We aim to create a stronger enabling environment for the nutritional care of pregnant women and low birth weight infants by improving regulatory frameworks to protect the rights of working women. Additionally, uh, we aim to strengthen health system capacity to improve both the coverage and the quality 
of nutrition services for pregnant women and low birth weight infants and create an innovative and comprehensive community model demonstrated to improve access to and use of nutrition services for pregnant women and low birth weight infants and ensure the continuity between nutrition services that are offered in the workplace um, and those that are provided um, in, in the home, in the community. Thank you very much, Rudy. Um, the Power Nutrition is definitely proud to be working with PBH on this program um, and with UNICEF as our implementing partner for it. Um, it was really great to hear of all of these programs, these really successful examples from the private sector. But I'd now like to ask Zulfi, Nadia, and Mira if there's a way that we could better highlight these successes and programs and how we can truly measure the impact of business engagement in addressing undernutrition. Um, Zulfi, I'll hand off to you first. I think uh, we need better data. So, as today's session is illustrating, there are examples that people narrate from their own experience, their innovations, their forays into the space, but it isn't systematically captured in a way that you could number one, rank them uh, in terms of the level of innovation and all of that, longevity, any evaluation, cost benefit assessments, and importantly, scale. So I think as this evidence uh, improves and uh, becomes more widespread, we need these examples uh, not only from the global, uh, let's say, large uh, multinational uh, industry folks, but also from increasingly local innovators. So I, I believe that it is possible now for us to systematically do this and to include within that evaluation, Kerry, uh, a robust example of scale targeting linkages with existing programs in terms of value added, and also links to private philanthropy. As we're beginning to discover as part of the COVID response in many places, private philanthropy played a significant role in terms of responding to local needs. And some of it was not just a one-off thing. I mean, these appear to be stable programs which are representative of how people um, give their zakat monies and also how people support some of these initiatives. I will make one uh, additional uh, comment on this in terms of just the urgency of the need. So we typically hear about private sector engagement in stable circumstances where the private sector typically either in its own sphere uh, looks at longevity of investments, a return on investments, and also capturing the sectors of the population that have the ability to pay. Uh, but I would like to see a lot more happening with the private sector engagement writ large in less uh, well endowed circumstances, humanitarian emergencies and crises where we still after so many years appear to have a very limited repertoire of interventions and commodities. Uh, and it is really a space in which I think increasingly we need the market to come in with competition for better products for much more sustainable products in terms of those that can transit people from humanitarian response to much more stable availability within the uh, local system and, uh, and also evidence generated around its effectiveness. So let me stop at that for now. I may come back a bit later. Great, thanks, Sophie. And definitely feel free to come back um, if, if you have more thoughts. I'll pass off to Nadia as well to comment on, on the question and also if she has any comments on, on what Sophie's present, uh, said already. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Sophie. Um, I absolutely agree with Sophie. I think we need better data. I think we always need better data. Um, and one of the things that has really become evident to me through doing this study is that though we have some data, you know, data could be much better. Um, in, in many areas to get better estimates, um, to get estimates for short-term benefits, for instance, for, for corporations, which you know was an area that was completely lacking in our study. Also, it wasn't a, a research goal, but um, we're planning this follow-up study now um, with one multinational corporation. And what's become clear to me is that data is just generally lacking. So we need better area in that area, in that space. Um, but then also for nutrition sensitive interventions, you know, the, the set of interventions that we've costed out um, for having a stunting impact are the, are the direct nutrition interventions. 
um, which evidence shows only impacts about 20% of stunting in totality. So the other 80%, um, you know, 50 to 80%, uh, whatever the number might be, comes from these nutrition sensitive or indirect uh, nutrition interventions. And the, the evidence on how those impact um, <clears throat> outcomes and the cost of those is just really scant globally right now. So I think we need to have better data so we can get better estimates in that space. Um, and then I think specifically for the, the multinational corporations that are that have these uh, amazing programs and targeting their workforce, it's incredible that you guys are embarking on these. Um, and I would just I would just push you to think again about the data piece. Once we have good data, we can measure impact of these programs. And I think there's data across you know, a broad spec spectrum really across the life course we should be thinking about both like demographics of your workforce, um, you know, their, what they experienced in childhood, their anthropometry, their social standing, that, that kind of data, but also their engagement in these programs, um, whether they're, you know, actively engaged, how much insurance might be available to them and so on. Um, their presenteeism, their absenteeism, um, their sick days, their personal days that they take, what their wages are. Now, these are the kind of data if collected well, um, and, you know, and coupled with the data from in enrollment in the programs that could be used to quantify and get good estimates of the impact the program's having on, you know, reducing stunting or reducing other forms of malnutrition. Let me just stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Nadia. Um, I definitely think that from the power of nutrition's experience, having data to show impact is incredibly important and motivating. Um, and I'm sure the other panelists will agree. Um, I'll pass off now to Mira um, if she has any comments on this as well. Yeah, so, sure. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and I agree with uh, both Zulfi and, and Nadia that more data is, is helpful, is needed. Certainly, uh, particularly in the area of uh, uh, immediate benefits, short, shorter term benefits, uh, because that's often uh, important from a private sector perspective, but also from a public sector perspective as well. But in addition to more data, and um, I think we need to, we need to learn I, what I've said earlier to communicate better, communicate with different audiences, how do we communicate these successes? The successes that Shahjan talked about, for example, in, in their cashew uh, industry, uh, how do we communicate that so that other uh, businesses can follow these examples? So that, I think that's a, a really important um, thing to think about. Audience segmentation, how do we target messages differently to different audiences? The second thing I think is really important to think about is um, I, I, and I think Sophie mentioned it uh, briefly, is around monitoring and evaluation. Um, just like in the public sector, we want programs to be evaluated by a third party. Similarly, in the private sector, these investments that are being made need to be evaluated by third parties so that there can be more credibility associated with, with these uh, successes, as they are being um, called, um, and and groups like uh, ACNI, the Access to um, uh, or in um, instruments such as ACNI, the Access to Nutrition uh, um, Index, are one example of sort of third party assessments of whether we are moving in the right direction. Uh, or not, and I think we could do more on that. Similarly, under the um, Ages of the Nutrition for Growth um, Summit that is coming up, uh, the Global Nutrition Report is setting up a nutrition accountability um, uh, framework. And it's important for the private sector to be part of that, to register their, um, their commitments, the kind of sort of commitments we've heard today, but then to track them over time and see whether these are delivered or not. And, and the last thing I would say is, um, uh, again, some, some things that Sophie's uh, mentioned already, which is acting at scale. And I, I'll, I will say, Smoothie, don't take offense, but uh, I, I have said this a few times that corporate social responsibility is sometimes uh, a little bit of a whitewash and a token investment in some cases. I, I'm not saying that is the case in, in, in your case, but in, in many cases, we've seen small CSR projects that invest $5,000 in, in doing good somewhere 
that's not the le level of engagement that we're looking for from the private sector. What we're looking for is, is changing core business practices uh, so that we actually get the benefits that we are looking for and that so that action can happen at scale. And, um, and I think, um, yeah, I could go on forever, but let me stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mira, um, and thank you, Zulfi and Nadia. I think the, the conclusion here is more data, data on monitoring and evaluation, to have commitments, to track them, and also to act at scale. Um, and I uh, built on one thing that Mira was oh. saying. Uh, Carrie, is that possible? Sure. Yeah, of course, that'd be great. Uh, I, I really like that you are emphasizing uh, that we need to be able to speak the right language depending on the target groups that we're talking about. And I'm an R&D person. I know a lot about nutrition, but I need to switch languages, if you like, yeah? uh, a lot within the business. And if I listen to some of these fantastic examples given today, the moment you can translate that into something where businesses feel that it will drive their competitiveness, that's the moment you get the flywheel going. So if you know an investment in workforce nutrition delivers something that drives the competitiveness of a private sector, I can tell you the, the first one uh, that makes that happen, number two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight will follow. So I think that's a bit um, building on what Mira was saying is try to translate that into those type of cases. Uh, and I think that's exactly what you are trying to do with the research that is presented today, eh, which is fantastic and beautiful. Uh, and I think taking that every time a next step further uh, would really help. So I just wanted to build on that mirror. Yes, thank you so much, Carla. And indeed, with the cost of stunting research that Nadia presented, our communications team is working diligently on having briefs that are specific to different stakeholders because we recognize the importance of speaking the right language to the people who are, who are um, consuming the information. Um, I'll just ask, just in case anyone else um, has anything uh, that they'd like to say about this question before moving on. No? All right. So earlier in discussion with Zulfi, he brought up the different role that national private sector businesses have compared to multinational corporations. We know that both have an important role to play, and the data Nadia presented showed us the very real impact stunting has. Zulfi, um, could you answer how you believe the nutrition sector could better engage with national businesses? And um, also, if anyone else would like to, to chime in after, that'd be great, too. Mute myself. So, so yes, of course, so Carrie. The the process does not have a cookie cutter, standardized approach. It depends totally on local context, and it starts with that very important part of the ten step process that we identified is the diagnostic, where you not only have the forest but also the trees. You need to look at data that you have for countries around priority areas of undernutrition in the main but also put on the table in countries where you have a double burden, the important role of the private sector in self-regulation and agreement on certain aspects of, of marketing uh, where you do not have uh, the, the us versus them situation of forever fighting sugar sweetened beverages and an availability of inappropriate food products in the school system, for example, or marketing uh, strategies. So I think that kind of a discussion needs to happen very early on because in many countries, it's not just under nutrition, it's also the nutrition transition which is in place. I mean, what we haven't spoken about since the morning, uh, since the session started is really the important role of the private sector in supporting uh, exclusive breastfeeding. And, and by that, I mean also therefore following the code of marketing, which is uh, underpinning all of that in countries in both letters and letter and spirit. So I think that initial discussion of stakeholders uh, with national academia, nutrition sector people, public sector, and civic society is important. That needs to happen. Once you're past that, then you also need to take stock of what is 
the status of the private sector in countries concerned. There are some countries, for example, where there is a non-existent private sector, and if it is, it's very small. And, and therefore, there is a much greater role for regional large-scale players or multinationals. Uh, and there are others where there's a mixture of both. Uh, increasingly, we are finding in countries with large populations, large as in, let's say, more than 20, 30 million population, that there is a role and, and there is an important contribution that local industry and local sectors can make. Their transaction costs are generally lower. They also have more sustainable supply chains and they imp importantly are there when others are not. Uh, the, the multinational sector sometimes is very dependent upon environment regulation, uh, their ability to work in fragile settings, whereas the local industry is typically very much attuned to those kind of uh, um, pulse changes at a local level. So what am I recommending? I think what you need to have is a dialogue at the very beginning, and that's exactly what I believe the scaling up nutrition movement tried to do. With, a, with an establishment of both the academic and a private sector interest group in countries where they could bring people together. And I very strongly support that process. It needs to be shepherded and nurtured very carefully because you know, it shouldn't bring a, become a finger pointing exercise very quickly, uh, but it also then needs to have a very transparent, clear dialogue around how do you make progress? How do you go from just a diagnostic to what can be done? And then the third important part in all of that is the role of the private sector in terms of supporting change and interventions at scale. So I believe very strongly that unless there is, there are profits to be made, unless people can recoup their investment, uh, they would never move into an area and we shouldn't expect them to. So I don't think the private sector is in there for just the goodness of their hearts or as Mira said, only for their small CSR role. I think there is, there've got to be business models where they have the ability to sell their products to those who can afford it and, and to provide their products through available financing funding mechanisms, which at times are available through government social safety nets to those who cannot. And, uh, and certainly for fortification, I think there are now large scale approaches where the private sector has an absolute role. So I think that step-by-step -step delineation as to how the private sector can or should engage in countries will depend upon the context and will depend upon the willingness on the part of both to move forward. And lastly, I think there needs to be a catalytic process. So in almost everything that I've done in global health, it is always useful to have some global examples of countries where that has been done successfully. We all talk about the pharma sector in Bangladesh as an example as to how you can have the best of both uh, addressing public sector needs, but yet also coming up with a profitable uh, uh, process so that they can also act as exporters and, and re uh, regional local suppliers. I think we need to keep that in mind when we bring in the private sector in a discussion around uh, nutrition needs for women and children. And it can be done quite successfully with a bit of support from people who know from good examples elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sulfi. Um, I agree the catalytic process would be really motivating and that businesses do need to have a profit. But I think the um, evidence that both you and Nadia have presented is that um, when investing in employees, um, you'll have a, a higher profit and also the community um, if investing in childhood nutrition will have better buying power, as Rudy um, said earlier. Uh, does anyone else want to add to this? No? Okay, so I just have um, one final question before going to the Q&A from the audience. I'd like to ask everyone on the panel one final rapid fire question. If we were having this conversation in 2025, what would you hope has changed? Um, if everyone could just give a very short, maybe 30 second uh, response, and I'll start with Zulfi. Off oh, the Zulfi, hook. you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought I was off the hook. So, um, no, no, uh, seriously speaking, uh, let me just continue with what I was saying. So, I think Nadia's work is uh, definitely groundbreaking, interesting. I'd like to see that. Uh, in press soon, um, because we need to have a wider dissemination and discussion around it. 
We also need to see its connectivity with previous work on, uh, on economic costs of undernutrition and the benefits of investment in nutrition. And here is a shout out to the past work that was done uh, by the bank uh, um, in collaboration with others around the nutrition costs of undernutrition. So we can marry the two, uh, we would have a good sense of what happens and what is happening in 2021. I think we would be remiss at this stage not to include within this the very important impact that we have had in this field of COVID-19. So a very important strategy moving forward would be also the role of the private sector in helping us rebuild fairer, more equitably and better as we move forward. So we need to therefore bring in that language, that lexicon in terms of how we would like to proceed. I hope this is not a one-off session. It is a refreshing session to have as part of the N4G buildup, but I hope that there is some continuity in terms of creating a platform whereby uh, academics, uh, scientists, economists, public sector program people, policymakers, and importantly, the private sector representatives can have an opportunity to sit together and work and also not only tackle the easy parts. The for, I find that the fortified foods and fortification is the easy part. But when we talk about nutrition in general, uh, what really breaks the camel's back, so to say, generally is not including the first thousand days, not bringing in infant and young child feeding, not bringing in the nutrition issue holistically, which then ends up by a very small section of the, of the private sector engaging in that discussion. So I would really like to see the dialogue move to the inclusion of those people in the debate. And that cannot happen without involvement of the UN system, particularly the World Health Organization and UNICEF. And so I hope this will be, I mean, all, all uh, marks to power of nutrition and colleagues on moving this forward. I hope this can be the beginning of a discussion in this space whereby we can stop finger pointing and start working together towards solutions, which cannot happen without the private sector engagement. Just to close, Kerry, people have to recognize that much of the groundbreaking work I think revolutionary work. I, in fact, at one stage even nominated some of the people working in that space for an international prize on management of children with severe malnutrition would not have taken place without the private sector's engagement. Had it not been for a small R&D company in France, Nutriset, to have come up with a formulation that could be used in the field. And now look at the expansion of ready to use supplementary and therapeutic foods across the world. But that was the private sector initiative. And, and it's an example of how that revolutionized in some ways the way we manage malnourished children worldwide in humanitarian and other settings. The same needs to happen across nutritional needs of women and children across the globe, not in just humanitarian and emergency settings, but in regular health and nutrition systems, in the food supply chain, in the food environment, also with increasing stakeholders that are coming on board and, and, and target populations, school age children, adolescents, young women, and the elderly who will also come into this in mix before long. So thank you. I hope this is the beginning of a journey. Yeah, thank you very much, Sulfi. We really appreciate that. And I think it's a, a big um, charge maybe for the power nutrition to continue this conversation going forward. Um, Amir, would you like to give a few comments um, on what you'd hope would change by 2025 with this conversation? Sure, and I'm going to be very, very brief, recognizing that time is almost up. Um, just, um, I'm imagining a wonderful world by 2025. Of course, I'm living in La La Land, but, but nonetheless, uh, it's always good to dream. Um, so I think for me, what I would hope is that by 2025, that the private sector, and it's not, as we've said earlier, it's not one private sector, but the private sector across the board is fully informed uh, on, as to why they should be uh, investing in nutrition and how they can be investing in, or how they can engage in this space. And, and there I go back to the other conversation we had earlier, it's not just the food businesses that we're talking to, but the kind of work that LVMH is doing, for example, going well beyond the food business. What can we do with, how can we bring in venture capital firms to recognize that they can do something for nutrition? 
So really getting that message out. Um, secondly, I would hope that in terms of uh, workforce strategies, uh, the private sector has embraced um, the good workforce strategies many of you have mentioned. But in addition to that, um, uh, issues around um, private sector um, uh, adoption of maternity leave, for example, is absolutely critical as well. Um, and, and I hope that that's something that will become part of the core business strategy of the private sector. Again, not just a welfare thing that they want to do, but a part of their core business strategy because their workers will be happier, healthier, uh, and, and better nourished, including the moms who come to work for them. And lastly, I, I would really hope, and we haven't talked about it, we don't have time to talk about it, but I would really hope that the private sector the food sector will completely eliminate ultra processed foods from the food sector because that is doing so much damage um, to the uh, to the health and nutrition agenda. So let me stop there. Like I said, I'm dreaming, living in la la land, but nonetheless, there we go. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mira. It's great to hear the optimistic um, hopes for 2025. We are at time, but we still want to give time for the other panelists to respond. If, if the others could just respond maybe in one sentence. Um, so we'll go with Carla first. Yes, thank you, uh, Carrie. Um, I will try to be very quick. Four things. One is awareness, cannot agree more. Closure of data gaps. Uh, I think we do have a challenge still on regulatory frameworks. So if I uh, can dream, then um, you know uh, there are some barriers there that actually uh, uh, hinder us to uh, to move. And I think the the fourth one is um, much even more than today collaboration. This whole area of nutrition is so multifaceted and complex. Um, I think, of course, I mean there is no discussion uh, that businesses have a key role to play. Um, but, you know, even we cannot do it alone. So we have to work together with governments, with academia, with um, uh, NGOs, etc. And I think that those partnerships are critical, where almost in all of the different dialogues that we're having in nutrition, that we realize what's the role of each of this stakeholder in order to move the agenda forward. So if we are making progress there in 2025, that would be very nice. Thank you very much, Carla. Smirti? Thank you. I'll, I'll try to be brief as well. Um, I mean, I think uh, there's a few things uh, that I'd love to see. Um, one is just really having more standardized reporting frameworks and better integration of, of nutritional programs into the social component of ESG. Um, so that way companies can really adequately report this out to investors and stakeholders as well. Um, and then also clear metrics and data on short-term business outcomes of investing in nutrition for supply chain workers, workforce, communities, et cetera. Um, the other thing I will just say is I'd love to see more companies setting ambitious uh, commitments. Um, PBH, we've set a commitment of uh, providing access to services as well as trainings for 500,000 women in our supply chain by 2030. So it's quite an ambitious target. And as part of that, um, the, our partnership with Power of Nutrition will be playing into that as well as we've been rolling out WASH trainings across our supply chain, um, which of course, uh, Carla noted is, is again, very key for um, supporting nutrition as well. And, um, and then the last thing I'll just say is again, just reiterating the power of collaboration. I mean, under, under nutrition and, and stunting, of course, as you know, is a systemic issue that can really only be solved um, by taking a holistic approach and, and having multi-stakeholders, government, academia, civil society, the private sector, um, coming to the table with their resources and expertise um, and tackling this together. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rudy. Um, Shajan, would you like to comment as well? Yes, thank you. Uh, nutrition, particularly maternal and child nutrition is considered as a standard ESG for the companies of any sector. Second, more and more companies are working innovative partnership and improve nutrition for their workforce as well in the surrounding communities also. So with the collaboration with more work, more engagement with the private sector, I am very hopeful brighter and brighter future will happen. Thank you. 
Great, thank you very much. And um, we'd like to thank Jack for providing a, a question. Unfortunately, we don't have time to, to answer it, um, but I hope that you were able to, to get an answer through your discussion. And uh, I'll pass off to Salim who will close the event. Oh, sorry, and Nadia, I apologize. Nadia, if you wanna give a, a couple uh, sentences. I think you may have missed Carla as well. Okay, all right. Um, well, I agree with everything that's been said, and um, I guess just just a final thought from me. I think we I'd like to see more commitments to um, rigorous research by 2025. I think there are many areas where we need to continue doing research, um, and the new proof data collection will help with that. But I think analyses by uh, industry, you know, for food and different types of industries, um, analyses looking at nutrition sensitive interventions and their impact on um, you know costs of malnutrition. Um, and then just, you know, analyses looking at some of the short term benefits to multinational corporations. So we can really hone down on, on, on what the benefits are and, and um, hopefully come up with plans to take action on that. Thank you. Thanks, Nadia, for, for being so brief. Um, and Salim, uh, I'll hand over to you now. Uh, thank you, Kerry. Uh, thank you to all our speakers today. Would like to extend our great appreciation to the audience for your participation and for all your comments. Sorry, we couldn't answer all your questions. But before we go, I uh, wanted to highlight a few points on how you can stay involved after this conversation. Please support and share our cost of stunting research and look out for the media launch and communications toolkit when it is finalized on the Lancet. My colleagues um, have shared some information on this via the chat. A recording of today's session will be published on the Power of Nutrition YouTube channel very soon by the end of the week. We will also create a summary report which the N4G organizers will publish after the N4G summit. We hope some of your questions would be answered there and have been answered through the discussion. Uh, finally, we would like to ask you to share any reflections on social media. Thank you for being with us today. We wish you a good day ahead. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.